All right. Good morning, everybody. Starting our third day, our last lecture this morning. And um, Mr. Guy Davies is going to talk to us about time series analysis. Uh, you know that tomorrow, so this afternoon, we're going to have a tutorial session. And tomorrow morning is also going to be a tutorial session. So there's no, no more lectures. This is the last one. And I'm hoping to have the slides up on the website um, this morning. And the tutorial material will also be on the website uh, as soon as I have the final versions of everything. And so otherwise, uh, please enjoy the lectures, and, uh, and we'll see you soon. Morning, everyone. Can you hear me? It sounds like this is actually working. OK, great. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, good morning. Um, Welcome to the time series analysis um, lecture part. So I, this is subtitled Dealing with Correlated Signal or Noise. It's uh, typically the largest challenge in time series analysis, especially if you uh, have no idea a priori what the uh, correlation is. And so today's um, lecture is going to be all uh, about working uh, in the time series. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to start with a, an introduction to me slide. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, um, the room is split roughly equally between uh, Helio and uh, Astro um, people. I am equally split. <laughs> uh, so I, did my, I actually did my PhD on um, uh, helioseismic instrumentation. My first uh, postdoc was on um, uh, solar in solar physics, on uh, again helioseismic uh, instrumentation. But more recently, I've switched to doing uh, stellar work, particularly astro seismology. Um, <clears throat> and so this is, uh, this is a pictorial um, expression of my career path, which is I started with some sort of instrument. Uh, <laughs> uh, then I started doing real observations before I then worried about the night sky a little bit longer. All those pictures are taken from Narrabri in Australia. It's, uh, it's a great place, and it's full, absolutely full of kangaroos. <clears throat> um, yeah, so uh, I want to set the scene for this lecture, which is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted if you ask questions as we go through. I've put a little uh, um, uh, separators in the slides where I'll, I'll pause and we can ask slightly more generic questions if you have them. So please stick your hand up. And if, uh, if I'm ignoring you, shout, uh, uh, let me know. Um, the, the, or my aim uh, for this uh, lecture and uh, uh, tutorial session uh, is to get you to a point where you uh, understand uh, how to treat and uh, estimate correlated noise in a way that will allow you to essentially take it out of uh, uh, the equation as a problem in your data analysis. The, uh, the setup here uh, is really good. Uh, we have three hours-ish um, to dedicate to lecture time and then three hours to the tutorial time. Which if you think back to the first day when we talked about where, whether or not people uh, prefer to learn by doing or uh, learn by uh, watching lecturers, uh, lectures, this is actually the hybrid. Um, and if you've done any uh, uh, pedagogy, uh, learning about teaching, uh, you'll know that the recommended way to, uh, to persuade people about things, to teach, to help people learn, is to cover the background material first, and then later on uh, uh, allow people to use that knowledge in a practical way to solidify understanding. It turns out that uh, exactly the same sort of pedagogy uh, uh, that we are using here today works for five-year-old children. <laughs> Uh, and there's a nice little, uh, <laughs> um, just to, just to emphasize how I think today's going to run, uh, the teachers for five-year-old, I've got a maybe five-year-old kid, the teachers say the, the following thing, that if, uh, if you tell them something, they forget. If you show them something, they remember. But if, they, if you let them do it for themselves, then they understand. And so that's, uh, so hopefully, this nearly three hours will be me telling you and showing you. Uh, and then the next three hours, uh, depending on which, uh, which room you're in, will be uh, you actually 
formally understanding, really getting a feel for what, uh, what it is uh, that's going on. Okay, so if at any point you feel like you're completely lost and have uh, lost track of everything, forgotten, um, <coughs> stop me and we can discuss it. The uh, lecture series is basically in a, a, a series of compartmentalized sections where hopefully uh, uh, you have understood the previous sections which will help you understand the, the later sections. So if you're struggling, let me know. This is how I'm going to break the, uh, the, the, the time down. Ignore the minutes on the left-hand side. That's largely for my benefit to make sure I stay on time. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time motivating uh, why you would care about correlation in the data, uh, giving you some examples, some background, doing a tiny bit on uh, correlated um, uh, 2D Gaussian distributions and uh, just setting the scene for why if you're working the time series and not taking care of correlated data, that's probably a pretty bad thing. Um, the next section will have an introduction to Gaussian processes. So uh, here, uh, <coughs> this uh, second section will mirror the first notebook in the tutorial. So here we're going to basically uh, <coughs> take a whole bunch of things that I reckon you know already, mix them all together, and get some stuff out at the, at the end. The, the middle section will be then applying uh, this uh, generic understanding uh, to more specific cases, so applying Gaussian processes. Uh, it's going to be uh, a decent side more math mathematical than the previous sections. And equally, uh, there is a second notebook in the tutorial that's going to mirror this process. And that uh, notebook is going to be building a Gaussian process that can be applied to data from scratch. And then the last section is going to be uh, an introduction to, so this is uh, a piece of code called Celerite, uh, not Celerite, Celerite, um, which is a French word. Fast. It means fast, does it? Okay. Right, okay, okay. Oh, well, that's good. That's a good choice, because the Celerite is a fast implementation of a Gaussian process uh, setup. There we go. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you've done any of this stuff before, I don't mean Gaussian processes, you've done any work before in astronomy, what you'll know is you can probably build the algorithm yourself, but also there is probably a stable and fast and uh, better algorithm that's available for download. Okay? The way to get an understanding of what's going on is to build one yourself. Uh, in reality, you apply the ones that are... Uh, um, people have put a substantial amount of time into. Particularly in celerity, there's some clever tricks in the lineage, linear algebra that speed things up uh, no end. Okay, so uh, that's what we're going to set out to do. I'll tell you now what the key takeaways from this session are going to be, uh, so that you have these in your mind as we work our way through. Um, and I'll tell you these at the end to see whether, uh, uh, whether you agree or not. But the most important thing, I think, is that uh, uh, in addition to all the things that uh, Chris and Frederick have uh, covered already, so uh, in terms of instrumental and whatever, noise can be correlated as a result of a physical process. Right? The uh, uh, uncorrelated noise is just Gaussian white noise. So one point uh, is independent of all the other points. Okay, correlated noise is just some statement that uh, there is some connection between the points. Um, I say don't, don't neglect correlation. It, it may be possible to neglect correlation, uh, but you should know that it's possible to neglect correlation if you're going to do it. This GP, this Gaussian process, what you'll find is it's just an extension of the multivariate uh, normal distribution. So if you understand multivariate normal distributions, you probably already understand the Gaussian processes. Uh, <coughs> um, the GPs, um, they have a, a set of interesting properties uh, that make it very uh, straightforward, if maybe not computationally, uh, to model correlated noise. And then the final point would have sort of been through already. There are a whole bunch of GP software implementations, but um, 
One that's nice is Celerite, and it's fast. Okay, so let's go straight to the, the motivation. So this is all about setting the scene for correlated data. Uh, I could have chosen solar data. I, in the end, I chose um, uh, uh, stellar data. This um, space telescope is the Kepler Space Telescope. It's not a particularly complicated telescope. Uh, I should caveat that by saying it's a space telescope, so it's very, very complicated. But it is basically just a telescope with 42 CCDs at the back. It's a, not a particularly good imager. Uh, the, uh, no one's cared huge amounts uh, about the resolution or the point spread function in the instrument because it's essentially a photometer for, for hundreds of thousands of stars. Okay, so it takes uh, an image that's about every six seconds on board, gets binned up to some uh, new number, which is maybe um, uh, typically 30 minutes for, for most stars, and then the data is sent down uh, um, uh, to Earth, where we then analyze it. Uh, Chris made an excellent point yesterday, which is you should understand where this data comes from, and you should know the steps that uh, have been uh, gone through in order to get data um, <coughs> I don't want to dwell on this too much, but essentially what you get down uh, from Kepler is a series of what, what are typically called postage stamps. So there may be five by five pixel imagets, uh, and there is one of these images for every point in the time series. So one every half an hour if it's the typical Kepler long cadence data. And to turn it into a one-dimensional time series, you normally say that there is some aperture, there is some region in this pixel where most of the flux from the star you care about is located. You pick those pixels and you sum all the flux, and then that is a one-dimensional time series. And this is an, ex an example of a one-dimensional time series from Kepler. The star is 16 sig A. It's my favorite uh, Kepler star. Uh, you'll notice a couple of things which... Um, uh, I've left in for, for completeness. One is the, uh, the early data. So this is uh, time on the x-axis. Flux, this is flux parts per million. So you take the total flux, you divide by the mean value, which centers everything around one. You subtract one, so you center everything around zero, then you times by a million. Okay, so you're, what, you're seeing the variation around the mean uh, in units of parts per million. Uh, this is f uh, nearly four years of data. The early data uh, is not very good. Um, the, <coughs> the imagette was not well chosen initially. Uh, after the first quarter of data, when that was received and understood, it was fixed. And from then on, uh, uh, you have a whole bunch of data. And I, I deliberately plotted it like this. So, uh, the blue is the original data. Uh, most people tend to do some sigma clip, which you can see is a bad idea. Um, <coughs> uh, so the black data is the sigma clip data. Um, does anyone have any comments uh, uh, about what they think the, this particular data might contain? I mean, doesn't it just look like noise? <laughs> yeah, if it, if it were noise, if it were white noise, you know, uh, sometimes the variance is a little bit higher. So the variance is a bit higher here, a little, a little bit higher there. If it were white noise, it would, you know, it would look a little bit like this. Um, but I, actually, it has a, a huge amount of uh, data and is almost completely dominated by the, noi uh, by the noise, the signal uh, from the star. It's noise if you're searching for planets, which is what Kepler's doing. Uh, it's signal if you care about stars. So I'm going to zoom into a small section of the, of the time series, and I want to talk about that a little bit. But I do want, to, I do want you to remember that um, uh, throughout this time series, uh, <coughs> the noise properties vary. To use uh, one of my favorite words, it's heteroscedastic. Right? The variance changes. It is not uniform variance throughout the entire time series. Okay, so I'm zooming in. Uh, this is a short section in time. This is a, a good section. Same question again. Does anyone have any comments about what might be going on in the, uh, the data here? Please don't be shy. Yes? 
I mean, does it look like just noise or? Anyone else from the back? Yeah, I mean, it, it is, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's stellar pulsations in addition to granulation noise. Um, but you can, you can make out, if you squint, you can make out um, the sort of back and forward uh, of the, the pulsations that are in there. I, I haven't put any error bars on the individual points because it gets a bit messy if you do that. <coughs> but this is an example of, uh, well, taken here, this is a short set of... Uh, short set of data, and it may be that if you were uh, so inclined that what you care about is planets, and you might be looking to see whether or not there is a planet that's transiting uh, in front of the host star in this data. And if you're looking for a transit, the best way to search for transit is in the time domain. Well, all but the very highest signal-to-noise transits are most easily found in the time domain as opposed to in the, frequency, in the frequency domain. But if you wanted to model this, say you wanted to fit, try and fit a transit, you could do this. You could get your favorite package that has some sort of function for a transit, like Batman or whatever. You could uh, test all the various parameters, and you could just say this was, uh, this was white noise. You could say this is uncorrelated noise all the way across the, the board here, and you could get some result. But what, uh, what I hope to have convinced you by the end of three hours or even six hours is that, that is not a very good thing to do. It's not a very good thing to do because this is correlated noise. Here, this is the power spectrum. Uh, Frederic has gone through this uh, extensively. Um, uh, I'll give you a couple of notes. The power is not scaled as uh, Frederic did, but it's, it's scaled parts per million squared uh, per microhertz. And the per microhertz is chosen because it means that um, power spectra that have been generated from different lengths of data set have the common noise uh, uh, levels, whether that be uh, white noise or the astrophysical signal. It means you can compare power spectra of different lengths. They should still look the same, apart from <coughs> various uh, caveats. But the thing that should strike you, and Frederick went through this as well, is that there is a slope in this data. The data uh, is uh, higher on the left-hand side, the low-frequency side, and lower on uh, the right-hand side. Uh, it's colored noise. It's correlated noise. If you want to know whether something... Okay. Thanks. Yeah, it, and actually, it's it's, <laughs> it, it's it's not an unreasonable point to say that you can, you know, provided that you tell people how you've scaled this axis, you can do almost what you want. I mean, don't break physical units, but um, uh, uh, to 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 a larger extent, it doesn't matter. The, the, the frequency axis is a little bit more fundamental. But this is this is correlated noise. Uh, we know it's correlated noise because of this uh, general gradient in the data. Uh, I feel like colored noise has been um, uh, uh, covered very well by Frederick. Um, so I'm go actually going to focus on what these things are. So this whole big, uh, that's a big bunch of spikes. I'm going to whiten the power spectrum now to, to, to bring them out a bit. So we're now, the previous plot was log frequency. This is linear frequency. There's a huge series of spikes here. Um, each one of these spikes is a mode of oscillation. So in this particular star, it's a star that's not very different to the sun, a little bit more massive, a little bit older, but uh, very similar. It has uh, an outer convection zone. Convection zone is transporting energy, so hot materials uh, flowing up, cooling, and then uh, falling down the other side. And this convection is a turbulent process. And the turbulent process, it turns out, creates acoustic energy, so sound. Um, but because a star is a big old ball of gas, this sound is trapped inside the star. Uh, and sound that's trapped inside something is like a musical instrument. It turns out that stars are actually a little bit like musical instruments. Right? Uh, <coughs> uh, if I had my trumpet with you, 
I could play you um, uh, a, a note on the trumpet. Uh, we could record the time series, and I could show you the, uh, the power spectrum of the sound of a trumpet. And what it would be is a series of peaks that are equally spaced and uh, uh, by the frequency, the, uh, uh, the pitch that your ear hears. There's some envelope on the top, so you'll know things like a trumpet can play middle C, and that sounds very different to a piano playing middle C. Uh, that's the timbre, and the timbre is basically defined by uh, the envelope over the top of the, those, uh, uh, those harmonics. Uh, <coughs> back to colored noise. Um, they, but the point is that uh, I understand where these spikes come from. I understand how they're generated, and they're generated from a turbulent process. They are, um, they are modes of oscillation. They are st stochastically excited and damped modes of oscillation. Right? And the stochastic, the, 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 the random part of this is, is really uh, the interesting bit for me, because we, 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 can, we can hone in on this. This is a zoom. Uh, this is showing you the zooming in on the uh, peaks here. They, from this point of view, they look basically um, pretty much regular, regularly spaced peaks. If we zoom in a little bit further, you see there's a touch more detail. Uh, let's just focus on this one uh, mode of oscillation here. The the blue data. Okay, so actually, I'll, uh, let me just. I, I meant to mention this earlier. I, I put SNR here. It's, um, it's not. It's not a signal-to-noise ratio. It's, it's, SNR is terminology we use um, because it uh, takes too long to describe what the hell is really happening. It's, really, it, it's just whitened. Um, okay. But uh, essentially, the, the, the mean of, this, uh, of the blue data and the black, uh, the black data should be one. It's, it's now normalized as, uh, in the way that Frederick uh, described but sorry, let me get back to it. So this is a, this is a mode of oscillation. Uh, it has some height, it has some frequency, but it also has some width. Now, the uh, Fourier transform of a damped harmonic oscillator, or at least in, in power at least, would be a Lorentzian. This is a Lorentzian. This, this mode here, it's got a little bit of uh, extra bits and bobs, but it's broadly a L Lorentzian profile. This is telling you, uh, or, I mean, I know this already because I've worked through from the physics of the excitation that it's a stochastically excited and damped um, uh, harmonic oscillator. But we can see this here, right? You could look at this, uh, <laughs> you could look at this and say, that is basically a Lorentzian profile. And the Lorentzian profile tells you uh, what's going on in the time domain. And what's going on in the time domain, I'm going to illustrate by Instead of taking the real data I have here, I'm going to isolate what, just one mode by just, just simulating one mode. So this, uh, hey, yeah. Yes, thank you. That's that's not, I mean so, <laughs> you should always go back and see if that makes sense. What you see here makes sense if you get it with the Yes. So that's the that's that's an that's an excellent point. Um uh, okay, so I've simulated this mode, and we, we know how to simulate this mode. So I'm not going to bore you uh, with this stuff. But what I want to do is I want to move from the frequency domain back to the time domain. So all the steps I showed you before started from the high-level data and moved into the power spectrum and then zoomed in. And so if we, if we go the other way, if we take this mode and we move back out to the time domain, uh, this is what you see. So this is a relatively short section of time. This is flux in parts per million again. And you can see things oscillating back and forth. Now the data is a lot cleaner. 
Uh, this is simulated. This is one mode of oscillation. And I think if I gave you the challenge of modeling uh, <coughs> this particular uh, data set, uh, some of you would look a little bit uneasy, but some of you would say, sure, I'll put a sine wave in there. I'll find the frequency. You know, uh, it's not quite going to do a great job of getting the amplitude all the way through the time series, but it'll be okay. Like, uh, if I'm looking for a transit, it probably won't make too much difference if I haven't got the amplitude quite right. But this is a, sh this is a short zoom of the process. So if I now zoom back out to the full time series, a four-year simulated time series, things, <coughs> things look a little bit different. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, anyone here want to model this? Okay, the answer is no, not really. Uh, uh, if you're like me um, and you wanted to do some sort of forward model, what you do is you just start introducing new parameters to take care of the variation in the amplitude. But at, at some point, you're just going to have so many parameters, it's going to become impossible. By the end of six hours, you'll be comfortable modeling this with two or three parameters. Okay, and this is the... This is going to be the genius of the Gaussian process. Uh, and uh, I don't want to give the punchline away, so I'm not going to tell you. But, but by the end of it, you will be able to do this. Um, um, computationally, doing four years of uh, Kepler data is, is uh, quite taxing. So we'll, we'll focus on much shorter data sets. But this is going to be possible. And that means that if you, just, you, know, uh, if you were searching for a transit in this, it would be possible. Now, it turns out that um, there were lots of modes of oscillations. You saw them, but we can treat that as well by uh, summing things in, in ways that are really straightforward. Okie dokie. So, uh, my aim now, before I take my first sort of like cut for questions, is I just want to go over some of the, um, the, the basics of 2D uh, multinomial distribution. So this uh, plot here, uh, these, uh, these wiggly lines, this is from simulated data, which is why the wiggles are here, but they're showing you uh, points of constant probability density. Okay, so this is some, uh, let's call this uh, X on that axis and Y on that axis. This is the 2D probability distribution. Uh, this is the 1D marginal distribution in Y, and this is the 1D marginal distribution in X. I hope I'm not saying too much that's unfamiliar to, to people. Uh, and we can, describe, we can describe this distribution here in terms of a 2D Gaussian distribution. I mean, it, we can do that because I've used a, a 2D Gaussian uh, uh, probability distribution to generate the data that goes into to forming that, but that, that's okay. Uh, um, yeah, there is some mean value. Uh, the, the mean in, in almost the entire of this lecture series is going to be largely uninteresting because I can change the mean of this distribution. If I only change the mean of the distribution, I'm just doing a translation. I'm just moving that distribution around. And that's a largely uninteresting operation. What is interesting is if I change the covariance matrix. So to describe, uh, to describe our distribution here, we rely on this covariance matrix. So uh, it's, uh, it's a 2D Gaussian distribution. So the covariance matrix is a two by two matrix. In the top left-hand corner, we have the covariance of x with x, which most of you would call the variance of x. Okay? So if we look at the marginal distribution up here, the variance of this distribution okay, is just going to be this number here. here. The bottom right is the same thing for y, the variance in y. And then <laughs> the parameter that really makes all the difference is this. So the point 0.7, you'll see that there is, uh, uh, there is this symmetry here where this is the covariance of x and y, and this is the covariance of y and x. The number here is giving us an indication of how uh, correlated the data is, how squished together this 2D distribution is, and in what direction the, uh, the, 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 the correlation goes. 
And I think this is, I'm sort of hoping this is a common language that you have seen before. And there's a neat way of describing a 2D normal distribution, which is this. This n just means normal. Then you have the means here. So you can read them off. The mean in x is 3, and the mean in y is 4. And then this is the covariance matrix. You can calculate the covariance. Okay, this is the equation for it. I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but essentially there is some data point x, or some, there's some samples which form x, and there's some samples which form y. Uh, you subtract the expectation value in x, the mean, uh, the expectation in y. Uh, you multiply them together, you sum, and you divide by, uh, divide by n. You can see that if, uh, if we are to take the covariance of x and x, that this, sorry? <laughs> Are you stealing my punchlines? <laughs> yeah. Basically, you've worked your way back to the equation for variance. Um, so that's the covariance equation. Uh, and the, but the covariance has important properties. This is an example. Uh, it's a largely trivial example that I'm sure you will have come across in statistics at some point. So if you have a distribution, and you're going to sum the distributions together, then the, the mean of uh, the x distribution plus the y distribution is just going to be the mean of x plus the mean of y. Okay, the covariance doesn't make any difference to that if it's addition. It does make a difference if it's multiplication. Uh, but the, the variance of the distribution here, of x plus y, is the variance uh, in x plus the variance in y and then plus this extra term where the covariance kicks in. If everybody is happy with that, I will move on. If, you, if anyone wants me to go over that further, I've got a great story about uh, uh, um, uh, monster husbands and wives. <laughs> right, so put your hand up if, if you want me to go through that a little bit more, and don't if you are happy with all of this. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could, so, uh, yeah, if you want, uh, I can do the, uh, the monsters in the bar tonight. Okay, but the, the, the main point is, and, and you know this already, that the covariance impacts the properties of the distributions. Okay? Let's take this one step further, and this is, uh, uh, this is notation that I'm going to switch back and forth uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the rest of this, uh, this talk. And that is if uh, I'm going to now take a point y. So a point y, for example, could be a point on the, the plot here. So it's here. We're going to call this uh, y1, for example. This is y2. So this uh, y here is now uh, a point that has a y1 value and a y2 value. Mu, now... It's going to be the, the mean of the distribution, so it's going to be this thing here. Okay, the, the, the mean in y1 is 3, the mean in y2 is 4. And we've got a covariance matrix, which we're going to call um, um, capital sigma here, and that's just this thing. Right? This equation here okay, is the multinormal, uh, uh, multinormal Gaussian uh, probability density function. And it allows us, given the properties of the distribution, which are described by these contours or by the maths up here, it allows us to get the probability of getting a data point from that distribution given the properties. Okay, so this is the probability of getting at some point y given all of this stuff. Uh, most of you will be familiar with this. Um, uh, this notation here is uh, essentially um, uh, a, uh, a shorthand for, for, for all of this stuff here. The calculation uh, can be done trivially with linear algebra on a computer. Um, uh, the, the one thing that, that uh, is a problem um, is the inverse of the matrix here, the inverse of the covariance matrix. Uh, if you are just using uh, an algorithm that uh, is not particularly smart, typically matrix inversions go as big O n cubed, which means if you have a large 
uh, covariance matrix, uh, your inverse calculation is going to be slow. Uh, yep, so this is just highlighting if you were going to do this, uh, say in a piece of code, as, as you will do in the tutorials, uh, capital sigma is the covariance matrix, mu is the, is the mean. And y is, uh, is a point in, the, in, the, in here. And this is two, this is in two dimensions, but this generalizes to n dimensions. And it generalizes really straightforwardly. If you aren't happy, if you aren't, well, if you aren't familiar with this equation, uh, you can actually work your way through uh, to going back to one dimension. So instead of now y being a point in this 2D plot, uh, y becomes a point in the 1D plot. So y is now a number. The mean is a number. Instead of a covariance matrix, we just have a variance. And uh, the only thing of note, really, is that the, the inverse of the covariance matrix here now turns up as 1 over uh, the variance in this very familiar uh, Gaussian um, probability distribution. OK, so um, yeah, main takeaways from this section is that noise can be correlated, but we, we, we can deal with noise. We have mathematical tools that allow us to cope with it. Uh, physically, we're talking about something, correlated noise being something where the current state depends somewhat on the previous state. If there is no dependence, uh, then we are not correlated. Um, for some people, we call this noise. For some people, we call this uh, signal. Uh, those are the main takeaways. Uh, so now this is your opportunity to ask any questions you have about uh, what I've said so far. Everyone's absolutely delighted with this. Ah, yes. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, M, N is the number of dimensions. Sorry, yes, yes, yes. Um, so that, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the dumb way of doing um, uh, matrix inversion. There are, there are many uh, wonderful tricks to bring that uh, matrix inversion down in terms of time. Anyone else? Okay, good. So um, this... This next section is, is, is now going to be an introduction to Gaussian processes. So I'm just going to build on this idea of the multi-nomial uh, distribution. I'm going to start in 2D just to look at some of the properties to, um, uh, as a refresher. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about conditioning. And then we're going to see how uh, we can do a little visualization trick, which will hopefully help you see how you can use a multi uh, nomial distribution to create something uh, that looks like a model for a time series. Okie dokie. So, um, uh, actually, yeah, let me get this. This is an important slide now. This is a slide for sources of information, and it's also a slide that uh, acknowledges that uh, plenty of the ideas that I'm about to present have been presented before, um, especially. Uh, the visualization I'm going to use, I saw it first done by uh, Richard Turner in a YouTube video. Uh, the Rasmussen and Williams um, paper, you can find it and download it for free at this website. Um, sorry? Book. book, sorry, book, yes, it's a book. Yeah. Um, uh, it is an excellent description of Gaussian processes. The, uh, the level is... Um, a smidgen beyond the introductory, but not an awful lot. Um, also, uh, um, this, this blog by Cat Bailey is actually uh, rather good. But um, one thing you'll notice, uh, one thing you'll notice in, in these links is the ML here stands for machine learning. ML, machine learning. Cat Bailey is a machine learning blogger. Uh, most people are using Gaussian processes for machine learning. Our use of them is slightly different. So they, uh, they like Gaussian processes uh, because uh, it's a special way that means that they don't have to make decisions, <laughs> uh, that they get to marginalize over all sorts of things, and it, and it helps them out when they don't really understand uh, what the function behind what they're trying to model is. Uh, for us, we're going to use them in a slightly different way. Okay, so there, there will be a little bit of... Uh, there will be a uh, difference, certainly in application, between all of these examples and what, what we're going to do. Uh, if you're looking for examples of application, 
uh, then there are plenty of examples. In the astrophysical literature where Gaussian processes have been applied, particularly works by Dan Foreman Mackey, Susan Nagran, um, Ben Pope, Will Farr. Uh, I could carry on, but um, <coughs> I think in terms of getting your head around Gaussian processes, uh, uh, this is a good list of things to, to look at. And as I said, it, this is also an acknowledgement that I'm using some of their ideas uh, in, in, the, uh, in how I'm going to present the, the present Gaussian processes. So this is a refresher. Uh, this is a slightly too, uh, different 2D Gaussian distribution. It's a slightly different way of plotting it because now I'm, uh, I'm putting the data points underneath. I've got some contours that represent the, uh, uh, the ISO probabilities. It's still simulated data, so the, uh, the lines are a little bit wiggly. And then we have marginal distributions here and here. This is the shorthand uh, for the probability of Y given some covariance matrix. Here's a covariance matrix. And now I'm going to ditch uh, the means. I said before that the, the mean properties are largely un uninteresting because it's a translation. So to make my life and your life easier, we're going to abandon the means. We're going to uh, uh, yeah, put everything at zero, zero. And um, yeah, this, uh, this particular covariance matrix, the covariance between y1 and y2 is just uh, 0.7. Uh, this is uncorrelated, so uh, covariance is zero here, uh, and what you can see is that this basically looks like a circle. Um, the uh, main idea, I guess, really, uh, um, here is that the, there's no squidging of the distribution, there's no axis of the distribution. Uh, when you draw... Uh, so, so you draw y2 from, from this distribution. Uh, it will come from the y2 marginal distribution. And if you draw then a y1 associated with a y2, it will come uh, simply from the y1 marginal distribution. You can increase the level of cor uh, correlation. Uh, uh, anyone want to have a guess as to what the sort of magnitude of the covariance would be here? There's a clue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, point 0.1, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the number of, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so the contours, um, for the, uh, so the contours that they're actually generated using a kernel density estimate, and they are an estimate of uh, lines of constant probability density. Uh, oh yeah, okay, so, th um, so uh, the point here is I'm, I'm, you, you, can, uh, you can measure, so this is actually the Pearson R, so this is a correlation coefficient, but because I've chosen the, uh, the variances to be one and one, uh, you can uh, just map the Pearson R back to the covariance. Um, this is 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.9. Uh, th this stuff should be fairly familiar. We are squidging down the distribution uh, the correlation is high here so it, and, and positive, so it occupies uh, this narrow space um, uh, uh, on, the, on the two axes. And you can see, and the important thing, is that the probability now of getting y, some point in the distribution, has to be different for different covariance matrices. Right? Each of these points is drawn randomly from the distribution. This point here is sort of likely in this distribution. If I move to a higher correlated, and so the point would be up here, it's extremely unlikely. The covariance makes a big difference in the likelihood of getting the data. And this is why it is a terrible idea to treat correlated data as uncorrelated data. You are messing with the statistics if you do that. <coughs> Conditioning. The great thing about correlation is it's giving you information. This extra information uh, that comes out uh, from the distribution. Um, 
This example here, this is the, uh, the, 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 the point 0.9 uh, correlation or covariance uh, distribution. If I have some point where I know what y1 is. So y1 equals 1 here, give or take. Uh, I can then say something about y2. So this equation at the top, I'm now discussing the probability of getting y2 given y1 and the covariance matrix. Conditioning, right? If uh, y1 is, uh, is this value here, this line, then the distribution, uh, the probability of getting y2 given y1 is going to be the distribution of these points along this line. Does that make sense to everyone? It's the conditional distribution, and it makes a difference because the marginal in blue here is this uh, um, normal 0, 1 distribution, and the conditional is this orange distribution. The orange has a different mean, and it has a different variance. You can calculate. It's actually it's straightforward linear operators to move from. So, this, uh, so we're now, uh, let me just go through this. Uh, top step here. Okay, so um, this mu star, okay, this mean that goes in here is a linear operator, W, W for no other reason than it's a linear operator on Y1 will allow you to get the mean. Okay, uh, because um, my example is very simple with mean zero and zero, correlations. Uh, uh, point nine, if you get a, um, uh, if you have a value of y1 that equals one, you expect, your expectation uh, is that you're going to get a value of one in y2. You can also uh, calculate the, so uh, this is now, in this example, that is just a, uh, it's going to be a variance, and that's basically telling you the width of this conditional distribution. In the uncorrelated regime, if you have y1, it tells you nothing about y2. In this regime, if you know about y1, you know something about y2. And we can figure all of this stuff into the likelihood calculations, whether it's the conditional uh, distribution or whether it's the marginal distribution. Uh, we can do this for different levels of correlation, so no correlation means the conditional distribution just looks like the, uh, the marginal distribution. Right, so if we cut the distribution along this orange line here, uh, you're just going to get the same distribution <laughs> uh, as if you marginalized over all of Y1. As we increase the correlation, uh, so the information we get uh, in the conditional distribution is better constrained. So the width of that distribution is decreasing. Uh, as we increase the correlation. Anyone got any questions about that before I move on? Okay. Right, the next thing, and I think this is the, uh, uh, this is the most important section to get. If you want to, if you want to get any section uh, in all of this, get this section. This, now, the lines are the same lines as before. Um, they're just taken from some simulated data, but they're describing the line of uh, constant um, probability. And I'm going to put, put a point on here, this red point here. This is point Y, where Y1 equals something that's a little close to zero and something that's a little close to minus point uh, 0.3, 0 0.4 uh, on the Y2 axis. And I'm going to make this second plot the second plot on the right-hand side, this now, on the x-axis, we have the index. So y1 has an index 1, y2 has an index 2. And all I'm going to do is plot the value of y1 here and the value of y2 here. So let me just uh, highlight these things. Right? This point is just reading off of here. This point is just reading off of there. Right, so conceptually, this is really straightforward, right? not doing anything particularly complicated. Um, 
I can do it for many points. So uh, these are color coded so that the colors on here match the colors on there. Uh, let's, take a, let's take an example here. So this point, this brown point here, you'll see that the, uh, the plots map right, so that they, um, the Y2 should be in the same place. OK, so Y2 is uh, less than minus 1. And Y1 here is going to be uh, wherever it is, just slightly negative there. You'll see that um, the lines we have are sort of flattish. Right? They're, they're not all over the place. They're sort of flat. Okay? If I show you the same uh, example, but now for uncorrelated data, the lines between these two points, they're all over the place. Right? And that's because there's no conditioning. There's no information on Y2 uh, given uh, Y1 above the uh, marginal distribution. Okay? And so correlated data has flatter lines. If the correlation was going to be 1, then, uh, <laughs> then um, for every value of y1, you would get the same value for y2, and these lines would be flat. Okay. Any questions on that? Everyone happy with this? Uh, do you have to normalize them? Well, this would, this would just, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, in this case, the, the fact that it's mean zero, um, uh, yeah, if we were to shift the mean in funny ways, that would change how these these things look, you're, yes, you're right, yeah. So this, yeah, this visualization only works because we've picked um, mean zero, zero for the 2D distribution. Yeah. But that's okay, don't worry about that, we'll come to that. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, so, uh, yeah, if you put different vari uh, variances between the different Y1 and, and Y2 distributions, it would look different, yes, you are right. Um, but for now, I'm trying to abstract down to the uh, simpler version, yes. Uh, and I'm, d I'm doing that because what I'm going to do is increase the number of dimensions. Okay? <laughs> sure. Uh, <clears throat> so what I've been showing you before are 2D distributions with contour plots and uh, draws from the distribution. That becomes a lot harder to do in three dimensions. So now, instead of showing you the plots of the, uh, of, of in three dimensions, uh, I'm going to switch to representing everything by the covariance matrix. We've, we've been through this. This has largely been the whole point of everything I've said so far, is that I can use a covariance matrix in order uh, to describe the distribution. It's just instead of a two by two covariance matrix as before, it's now a three by three. Three by three means we're dealing with three dimensions. And uh, to save your uh, eyesight when we go to uh, large numbers of uh, dimensions, I'm going to just color code uh, the covariance matrix. So um, this yellow is going to be 1, uh, blue is going to be 0.8, and this, uh, whatever this is, purple is going to be 0.6. Um, as we get uh, to higher dimensions, uh, these won't show absolute values, they'll show relative values only. So purple won't always be 0.6, it will just be the lowest value in the covariance matrix. But we can use the covariance matrix, and then I can uh, draw random numbers from the, uh, from the distribution, and I can put them uh, on my indexes. Okay, so here, this is the 3 by 3. Three indexes, there are some uh, points here in index 1. Uh, the correlations between the two then tell me something about where the next points are going to be. And then the, uh, uh, the correlations here, so these are covariances really, I suppose, uh, tell me something about where the next point is going to be. Everyone happy with this? 
Okay, the next slide is the ah moment. Do we need to practice going, ah? Okay, ah, that's what you want. Ah. Okay, if we generalize to many more dimensions, it stops looking like some horrific scatter plot. Okay, and starts to look like a function. Okay, so this is a covariance matrix. It's got whatever the number is. Should have counted this beforehand, shouldn't I? It looks like it's nine, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's got nine dimensions, okay? And I plug in the covariance matrix, mean equals zero, and I get out some points, and the points are then plotted. This is index across the bottom, okay? And so for this covariance matrix, okay, the points uh, uh, depend. So this is, this is now looking at this spread across uh, the anti-diagonal here. Uh, the points depend on each other in a strong way that keeps the function smooth. And I can go again. Uh, this is now a larger, I'm not going to count these, this is a larger covariance matrix. And again, this is index on here. These, the, the, the three different lines are just three different random draws from this distribution. Okay, but if we stop using index here and replace this with time, this can just be a function that we have that we could use to model data. Anyone want to go, ah, oh, now? <laughs> okay, um, and uh, what we're going to do, we're going to get a little bit more into you know, how you build covariance matrices, what are sensible choices, um, what does everything mean? Uh, how do you make sensible decisions? How do you actually turn that into something that you can use probabilistically? But it's at this point that I reckon I can, I can make the first definition that's actually useful, which I'm going to uh, say loosely, right, a multivariate Gaussian of infinite length. So these are discrete points. Okay, We can turn them from discrete points into something that's of infinite length by having a function that describes the covariance matrix. Right? If I can set up any sort of function whereby I input some parameters and for every possible value can generate a covariance matrix, we have something that has infinite length. Okay? And the infinite length here then allows us to have uh, infinite length functions. And each function we have here is the equivalent of a draw from that distribution. Okay, so we can have an infinite number of distributions. Sorry, an infinite number of functions, not an infinite number of distributions, an infinite number of functions drawn from these distributions. That's the loose definition. Uh, the Gaussian process is an extension of a multinormal distribution to uh, an infinite uh, number of dimensions. This is the loose definition. Does anyone have any questions? Or? Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, so I mean, uh, technically, this, well, do we want to have this discussion? Yeah, sure, why not? Uh, this covariance matrix here, I could draw uh, random numbers from this distribution an infinite number of times, um, and that provides me with an infinite number of functions. Sorry, say that again. Um, so th these curves, the, the green curve here, that I'm tracing out with a pointer. Uh, let me discuss how I do this uh, numerically, because that might shed a little bit more light on it. So um, almost every programming language <laughs> worth its salt uh, has some function where you can put in mean values and a covariance matrix, and you get out random deviates that are drawn from the multi-normal distribution described by the mean and the variance. Right? If the covariance has, I don't know, 15 uh, dimensions, then you get out 15 points. And then I just put these points 
uh, one by one, index one, two, three, four, etc. Does that make a bit more sense? Okay. Yeah. So uh, now what we care about is if we, uh, so if we were to try and isolate things down, like this point and that point there, they are just two points. Uh, the correlation between those two points is going to be one of the squares that's just, well, wherever it is, it's going to be somewhere around here and just off the axis. The correlation between this point and this point is going to be this square here. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm actually going to show, uh, I'll show this a little bit later on as well, actually. Um, <coughs> but basically what we have is the covariance matrix holds uh, the covariance information between all the points. Okay, and this color representation is showing you where you have these, uh, uh, these yellow brighter colors, there's more covariance, more correlation, and when there's darker colors, there's, I mean, it's much, you know, sort of close to zero for the... Uh, some things are uh, a long way. Yes, absolutely. Yes, that's that's a great point from uh, from the back there. That if this was to be white, if this were to be white noise then all of the elements off the diagonal would be zero. And then the elements on the diagonal would just be describing the variance of each point uh, in the time series. And that gets you back to uncorrelated noise. Yes, good point. Would you be able to see a correlation between one subdiagonal to say one zero? Like, if you have an n step of uh, the density, see a correlation between one subdiagonal? Yes. Yep, that's an excellent question. The answer is yes, this generalizes, provided you set up the covariance matrix to respect the difference in... So uh, a good example, like I think of what we're discussing here, is a time series that's irregularly sampled. Uh, if you had, say, some time points over here and some time points uh, over there, you can set up a covariance matrix as long... OK, as lo those uh, indices that are represented, you just have to uh, use the difference in time as the metric that decides the covariance. Yeah, and when we do kernel building in a bit, you, you'll see that. But that gives you like millions of worlds, you can finish uh, combinations. Yeah, that's what, I mean, that's what we want from the Gaussian process, yeah. <laughs> we want, we, I mean, no kidding aside, we, we want this to generalize to, 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 to everything, uh, yeah. If you think about it in terms of uh, 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 the, the space that I've put between the indices here, I've just, I've just done them regularly. I could just plot them irregularly. Uh, it would still be the same thing. You know, the, the curve will start to look different. But, yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, here's the thing I've been desperately trying to... Uh, to avoid, which is the formal stuff. So everything I've done so far has been largely informal, right? This is the, the formal thing. So um, yeah, F is a Gaussian process. If you can select uh, some set of T, okay, so T1 to Tn, and it has a multivariate normal distribution for all of these points, okay? Uh, that's that statement there. We've used this notation already. The components of this are m of t, which is any function uh, that maps any t index to a real value. This is giving you the mean, uh, the function that describes the mean. You input time, you get back mean values. If you were fitting a radial velocity curve that you think is deterministic, you would include the radial velocity curve in the mean function time, plus all your other parameters of the radial velocity curve. Then that's a function that maps to a real value, that gives you your mean. KTT is the kernel, or the covariance function, 
And it's got to be able to generate a positive semi-definite matrix. We've got to invert this at some point. Okay, and uh, this, this crazy little notation here um, is that the small k, t-i-t-j, is a function that we can define. So that you can input uh, some time and another time, or even the same time, and it will return back a number that can then be put back into big K TT, which for a discrete set of time builds a covariance matrix. Does anyone want me to go over that again? <laughs> sure. Okay, so small k T I T J, right? If we had a time series and uh, at time 100 and time 120, we've got data. We can, uh, we, we've got a whole other bunch of other times as well, but we can calculate the covariance between the two uh, points. Sorry, let me put it around the other, the other way. We can calculate something that proposes a covariance for these two points by inputting the two times, doing some calculation, and returning a number. And that, that, that number then populates the ij element of the covariance matrix. Right? So ktt, right, you can put any t value in and get out a k, or you can put a select number of t's in okay, and get out a covariance matrix for the data that you've actually observed. And then this, 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 uh, this little bit here, every finite subset of the domain T has a multivariate normal function. Uh, let me just put this the other way around, that if, if, if the Gaussian process is a generalization of the multinormal to an infinite number of dimensions, then you can go backwards, right? By selecting a, a finite set of times, then instead of having a GP, we're back into having a multinomial distribution. Okay. Everyone's still smiling, which <laughs> this never happens. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> um, I've got time. Well, we can. We're a few minutes away from coffee now, so I've actually had a schedule, which is very, very rare. So, um, does anyone have any more like high-level generic questions, or would it be better to break for coffee and people can ask me individually? Yeah, so, um, uh, so there's, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, so that becomes a deterministic function. Yeah, I think. Is what we're saying here. Yeah. That that the I mean, yeah, if Yeah, okay, yeah. If there's no noise in the signal, yeah, then you I mean I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether you can invert that co covariance matrix, but but yes, in in principle, then sure. Uh, uh, because it's deterministic, uh, given one number there, uh, maybe we have to be careful about degeneracies. But ignoring degeneracies, yes, uh, uh, any value there will uh, tell you what value are you are going to get over here. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, it's going to look all, all yeah all yellow. Let me, just, let me just take the point you, 
Uh, you said ones, and that might be my fault, because I've been using covariance and correlation interchangeably. But the correlation is, uh, is the, uh, uh, the number that describes the correlation, and it varies between minus 1 and 1, and has no units. The covariance has units and uh, can, can be any, uh, any value. Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I think, uh, I think I'm, yeah, I'm worrying about implementation, but yeah, yes, I agree. From the, uh, that's an excellent point, from the, from, from real early on. So uh, this is a stochastically excited mode of oscillation. Um, what we're actually measuring with Kepler is the brightness of the star. But that's the brightness of the star changing is actually just a consequence of the, uh, of the acoustic wave. So that it's a longitudinal pressure wave, gradient of pressure is the restoring force, so that as the gas is compressed, uh, it gets hotter and brighter. And as it's rarefied, it gets cooler and dimmer. So we see that uh, in, the, in the data. Physically, we're talking about the star perturbing itself ever so slightly out of equilibrium and then coming back into equilibrium, overshooting, and then oscillating around a point. Okay? That's why it's correlated. Okay? Because there's something physical that's happening inside the star. Uh, this perturbation, yeah, it's the same as if I had a big old slinky. I could pull the slinky down and let it go, and it would just oscillate back and forth. Actually, a much better example would be the longitudinal wave, but uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. This is... So this is a simulated mode, but uh, it may as well be in the sun, absolutely. They, they, uh, in the time domain and in the frequency domain, they look just like this. Yeah. This tutorial is going to be really easy if you understand it all. That's great. OK, so instead of, um, uh, I, think, I think it would be sensible to break here for coffee then, and then I'll restart after. Uh, after coffee, uh, where we'll talk uh, much more about applying the Gaussian process and the uh, and um, maths. Yeah. Okay.